All right, folks, joined once again by Senator Bruce Tarr. Thanks for joining us, Senator Tarr. Hi, Corey and Heather. Great to be with you again this afternoon. So I know we're really short on time. You got to get to a conference call, but uh, can you just sort of give us a brief update from the State House? Sure, and I, I really apologize for the brevity of my time here, but uh, there's a lot of things happening uh, in state government, a lot of things happening at the State House. One of the things that uh, just happened this afternoon is that a conference committee reached agreement on the eviction bill. And so that means the three members of the Senate and three members of the House uh, came to an agreement, uh, generally speaking, on what that bill should look like. And I expect it, it's gonna come to the floor tomorrow. Now, I wasn't completely happy with all of the pieces of that bill, but I think we still should move forward with it. And I expect, again, we'll move it to the governor's desk tomorrow between the House and the Senate. The second thing that is happening is a bill relative to liability for healthcare professionals, which seeks to give them some protection for dealing with the unparalleled situation that we're in right now and understanding that they might have to make difficult decisions that we don't want them to feel uh, that they need to be second guessed about. So two bills gonna come to the floor tomorrow that are very important. So uh, really a lot happening here legislatively. That's really exciting. Those are two really important points. Bruce, could you have a t minute to tell us anything about the tracking and tracing efforts of the state to track the COVID virus? So I do. And, and actually, Heather, this is one of the more sophisticated things that states are doing. And I think as, actually Massachusetts is leading the way in terms of this effort. And uh, you know, I rarely use notes, but I'm going to do it right now just to make sure I get this right. So um, the partnership that's been stood up is with Partners in Health. And they actually are going to hire over a thousand people to do this work. And the effort is underway. And it's so important because if we can trace the contacts of people that have tested positive, we can seek to shrink the transmission of the disease through that circle of people. So this is a really sophisticated element of uh, controlling the pandemic. And I'm really proud of the fact that Massachusetts is so far advanced with it. It's really exciting. They say that this is the only way to address this monster, I think. Well, you know, as we have so much discussion about how we're going to re-enter uh, the normal world, and, and normal is a term that's being constantly redefined these days, but as we think about how we're going to get back to some of the things uh, that we've been used to, like having businesses open and being able to move around a little bit more, I think there are a couple of things that are going to help. Uh, one is tracing, and the other one, which is even more advanced, is the idea of testing antibodies so that we can determine who in our society has antibodies to COVID-19 that we don't necessarily have to worry as much about being vulnerable so that they may be able to be able to return to work a little bit sooner. They may be able to be part of the healthcare workforce a little bit sooner. And so it's just an indication of what the new world might look like for us as we test people who uh, have had the disease, who do have antibodies, and as we look for contacts, because one of the critical things about coronavirus that makes it so dangerous is its rate of transmission. So I'm told that, for instance, if you look at the seasonal flu, that transmits on a one-to-one -one basis. But if you look at coronavirus, the ratio was more like three to one. So as you multiply that out, you know, three times three times three, you can see why exponentially we've seen such a rapid spread of the disease around the world. Is, are there any laboratories, or we have such great laboratories and medical institutions in the state of Massachusetts, is the state aligning with any to work on the antibody? Uh, That's absolutely happening. And uh, right now, I know they're working on the tests that are going to be needed. Uh, again, it's a, pretty much a next wave kind of an issue right now as we begin doing contract tracing, which is incredibly labor intensive. But yes, uh, there's a lot of discussion going on behind the scenes about uh, antibody testing. We've actually had constituents call about it, saying that this would be a good idea, and we think it's a good idea too. And it's just a question of which good idea gets in the line where, and uh, that certainly is one of them. And one other exciting thing that I think it's important to talk about, and I know offline we talked about it a little bit, Heather, is the issue of the MERT, uh, the Manufacturing uh, Emergency Response Team. I am so enthusiastic about this because it gives the ability to play in our strengths, to take our world-class healthcare institutions, our, our institutions of higher learning, our researchers, and put them together with our manufacturers to create the kinds of things that we need, 
but for far too long have been dependent on offshore sources for. So things like personal protective equipment and ventilators and tests. And it's involving some really exciting people like the folks from Worcester Polytech and UMass Lowell. And it's already gotten some pretty high profile manufacturers, including one that we have a particular fondness for on Cape Ann, and that's New Balance. And they've actually started making masks. That is such great news. Uh, not such great news, the nursing home situation in Massachusetts. Bruce. What is being done by the state to detect, prevent, and manage the COVID outbreaks in the nursing homes? So let me just tell you, this is a deeply concerning situation, not only because of what's already happened, but because of what could happen, because nursing homes necessarily are an area of concern. They house concentrations of folks that are in the high risk category. And unfortunately, we've seen the consequences of that already play out. So one of the things that's changed is a lot of testing. And, and pretty much right now, any nursing home that asks for testing can get it, not only for the patients, but for the staff. Now, here's the result of what's been yielded by that testing. Uh, right now, uh, as the number of folks that have been tested uh, as of Monday, roughly, uh, are about 3,446. Those are the number of positive tests in nursing homes. And the number of nursing homes uh, are 378. And the number of facilities that are reporting at least one case of COVID-19, so I, I juxtapose those numbers and I apologize, but the number of facilities reporting at least one case are 201. So as we look across the state, we see a lot of nursing homes uh, facing this problem. And that's why uh, state government has intensified its efforts to try to deal with it in, in a whole host of ways. And I know that you're aware of some of them uh, like increasing uh, funding. So if you look at the total amount of funding that's been allocated, it's about $130 million to try to help nursing homes, uh, $50 million uh, for supplemental payments uh, as part of their provider agreements through MassHealth, uh, another $50 million for 15% rate increase, which is really, really important, and then $30 million uh, to create some uh, particularly dedicated COVID-19 nursing facilities. So this is something that we need to address. I'm very pleased to see that there's a lot of movement on this, but it is deeply, deeply concerning. And so there are additional things that are happening. Uh, first of all, I mentioned testing, and that is critically important, uh, but also distributing more PPE uh, to nursing homes. Uh, and there's been a lot of that happening, including the distribution of about 169,000 uh, N95 masks and KN95 masks. And here's a, just something that's very interesting is that KN95 is the standard that's used in China for what is considered an N95 mask in the United States. And it seems that almost every country has its own identifier for that particular kind of mask. And so China's KN95, in the US we're N95, but what's really important is the efficacy of the material to filter out particulate. And that's the standard that the masks need to meet to be at the US N95 level. So I understand that the Patriots plane that arrived from China with a lot of masks, many of them were the KN95. KN95. So are they OSHA approved or uh, yeah, yes, and that is a great question, Heather, and I'm glad you asked it, uh, because there have been a lot of folks that have been hearing rumors about the fact that those masks aren't necessarily efficacious, and that's been a concern to a lot of us. So the short answer, and I had the opportunity to discuss this with Governor Baker uh, just two days ago, is that, the, again, the filter material in those masks is effective for filtering out the kinds of things that we're concerned with in terms of the COVID-19 virus. The difficulty with some of them is their size. And so being able to fit closely around the face is an important part of the protection that those masks offer. And so they, they certainly are good in terms of the material they're made out of. And there's a lot of thinking going on about how to make them perhaps fit a little bit better. And as we all know, one of the key things is right here. It's the bridge of your nose and being able to form that seal around it. So uh, the governor uh, mentioned to me that the masks certainly are useful. They certainly are offering protection, uh, but there is some concern about the fit. Bruce, we are running out of time. 
and I know you have to get to a meeting. Is there anything important that you, one last piece of information you would like our constituents to know? So one thing I, I would remind folks, Heather and Corey, and I hope we can talk again soon because there is so much to discuss. But one thing I wanna remind folks is there is a continuing need for blood in Massachusetts. And I try to say this at every opportunity that I can get, and it's important to be able to call the Red Cross at 1-800-RED-CROSS if you're able to donate blood. And the second thing that I would remind folks, you said one, but you know I gotta get a second one in, mm -hmm. and that is please call 211 for information uh, about uh, the coronavirus. There are lots of good things on there, including uh, people you can talk to about maintaining good mental health and a lot of resources for folks that are survivors of domestic violence who may be feeling uh, particular anxieties about their vulnerability right now in the current climate. So please call 211, please call 1-800-RED-CROSS, and please watch 1623 Studios for some of the best local programming in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. You're always a friend. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you both. Let's talk again soon. Look forward to it. Take care. Thank you.